Okay, this is chapter 11, so the muscular system. So we're basically going to learn about muscles. You guys are going to learn about 75 locations of muscles and some of their actions, their origins, and their insertions. So first of all, review the functions of the muscular system. It produces movement, of course, that's very important. It stabilizes body positions because, remember, it's attached to bone. And it also generates heat, which is called thermogenesis. So when you get cold, you start to shiver. That is actually your muscles trying to generate heat. So how does it contribute to homeostasis? Well, it contributes with the integumentary system because the muscles will pull the skin to actually produce facial expressions and also increase or decrease blood flow to the skin. Skeletal, it works with the muscular system to produce movements, of course, and again, stabilizes body position, stabilizes joints. The nervous system has all three types of muscle tissue, which respond to nerve impulses and involuntary nerve impulses called shivering, like I was just talking about. When you go outside and get cold, you start to shiver. The endocrine exercise is going to improve hormone actions like insulin, for example. If you are diabetic, you are told to exercise to try to help your overall health, and it will also improve the action of insulin. Muscles also help protect some of the endocrine organs. The endocrine organs actually lie in the center of your body, basically, and again, you'll learn about that in AMP2. Cardiovascular, the pumping action of the heart, that's a muscle. Smooth muscle helps regulate blood flow, the arteries. Skeletal muscle help with venous return because the veins have skeletal muscles on either side to help get the blood back to the heart. And it also exercise improves the efficiency of the heart. And again, you're going to learn about the cardiovascular system in AMP2. The lymphatic system, skeletal muscles protect some of the lymph nodes and the vessels and also help promote lymphatic flow. And again, that's second semester. Respiratory, <clears throat> your skeletal muscles are involved in breathing. Smooth muscle helps adjust your bronchial diameter. Skeletal muscles vibrate your vocal cords to produce sound, so the reason that we can all speak. Skeletal muscles are also involved in coughing and sneezing. It's a protective reflex. If you get something in your respiratory tract, you're going to either cough or sneeze to try to get it out. And exercise improves the efficiency of respiration as well. So you should be seeing a common core here. Exercise helps improve everything. Digestive skeletal muscles protect and support the abdominal organs. They're involved in chewing and swallowing. And then smooth muscle, of course, is your GI tract. Urinary, skeletal, and smooth muscles control urination. And reproductive, they cause the ejaculation. Smooth muscles help egg, move the egg through the fallopian tubes and regulate uterine contractions during menstruation and childbirth. And again, all of these systems you're going to learn about in AMP2. So skeletal muscles produce movements because they exert force using tendons. Tendons attach muscle to bone, and what they do is they pull on the bones to produce the movement. Muscles only pull. They do not push. So you're going to have muscles working in pairs to get a movement done. So you'll have one muscle pulling one way and then another muscle to pull the other way. So basically you have a muscle doing a movement and then another muscle to undo that movement so to speak. So again generating heat, producing movement, stabilizing body positions, characteristics of muscle tissue, it's excitable, it's elastic, it's contractible, and extensible. So basically meaning that action potentials can excite it and it can contract and go back to the original shape that it was in. It can also stretch and go back to the original shape it was. So most muscles produce movement. Tendons are going to attach muscle to bone and then produce the movement by pulling on that bone. When the muscle contracts, it draws the other bone towards the other. So it draws one bone towards another. Most muscles cross at least one joint and they're attached to the articulating bone that kind of forms that joint. 
with the exception of face, facial muscle, face, facial muscles. Oh, I can't say that. So what we have are two points. We have an origin and an insertion. An origin is where the muscle tendon is attached to the stationary bone, so the bone that does not move. The insertion is where the muscle tendon is attached to the movable bone. So the origin is attached to the stationary or not movable bone. The insertion is attached to the bone that moves. So usually the origin is proximal and the insertion is distal. So the insertion is pulled towards the origin. Remember that. So now we're going to talk about a few muscles. The biceps brachii, the origin is the scapula. The belly of it is the main fleshy part between the tendons. And the insertion is the radius on the radial tuberosity, which hopefully you remember from your bone practical. As you can see, they're color coded to match up the origin, belly, and insertion. Some important things to know, muscles typically do not cover the bone they move. Muscles in the arm move the forearm. Muscles in the forearm move the wrists, the hands, and the fingers. Muscles in the thigh move the leg, and muscles in the leg move the ankles, foot, and toes. So the muscles are usually above the bone that they move, so they're superior to the bone that they move. Another important thing is that bones act as levers. <clears throat> levers have three parts, a fulcrum, a load, and effort. The fulcrum would equal our joint. The load or whatever resistance is our bones. And the effort, so the work being done, is by the muscles. So we have three classes of levers, first class, second class, and third class. First class levers are like a pair of scissors. The effort is in the scissor end. The fulcrum is the middle of the scissors. And then the load is whatever you're trying to cut. Second class levers are like a wheelbarrow. The fulcrum is the wheel. The load is whatever's inside the barrel. And the effort is you're lifting it up. Third class levers are like tweezers. The fulcrum is at the end. The effort is the middle because that's where you're putting the effort. And then the load is whatever you're trying to pick up or get out of your skin. So if you're trying to get a splinter out, for example. So muscles, again, have to act in groups because they can only pull. So they're arranged in antagonistic pairs or opposite pairs to generate movement. So the prime mover is the muscle that causes the desired action. The antagonist yields to the effect of the prime mover, so it's the opposite. So for example, the biceps contracted, the triceps underneath it is relaxed. When the biceps is relaxed, the triceps is contracted. So the biceps will do one motion, the triceps will do the other motion. Because again, muscles can only pull. So the biceps will pull, and then the triceps pulls. So flexion of the forearm, biceps, brachii is contracted. That's the prime mover. The antagonist is the triceps brachii while it's relaxed. To extend it, they switch. The primer is the triceps brachii contracted, and the antagonist is the biceps brachii relaxed. So flexion of the forearm, you have flexion. The biceps brachii is the prime mover. Antagonist is the triceps. To extend now the triceps is the prime mover and the biceps is the antagonist. So when the biceps contracts, you have flexion. When the triceps contracts, you have extension. And you have to know that for your lab practical coming up. Synergists are muscles which help stabilize the prime mover. So like the temporalis and the masseter muscles help elevate the mandible. The hamstrings collectively are three muscles in your posterior thigh. They flex the leg. And the quads are four anterior thigh muscles which extend the leg. Muscle fibers are also arranged in parallel bundles within the fascicles, but the arrangement of these fascicles in relation to the tendon can vary. So fascicular arrangement is coordinated with the amount of power a muscle can produce and the range of motion a muscle can produce. 
So how those fascicles are arranged is going to matter. So here are some arrangements, parallel, fusiform, circular, triangular, and then pennate, either unib, bi, or multi-pennate. And then there's some examples that go along with those. So make sure you're familiar with those. Characteristics used to name muscles. The first thing is the direction of the muscle fibers. For example, rectus muscles, the fibers are parallel to the midline. Transverse muscles, the fibers are perpendicular to the midline. And oblique muscles, they're diagonal to the midline. So for example, the rectus abdominis in your abdomen, they run parallel to the midline. The transversus abdominis run perpendicular to the midline. And then the internal and external obliques are at diagonals to the midline. They can also be named by size. Maximus being the largest, minimus the smallest. So for example, we have the gluteus maximus and the gluteus minimus. And then longus is the longest and brevis is short. So we have the perineus longus and the perineus brevis. It's also called the fibularis longus and the fibularis brevis, by the way. Or they can be named by the shape of the muscle. Deltoid is triangular, trapezius is trapezoid, and serratus is sawtoothed. So your deltoid muscles are triangular muscles, your trapezius muscles are trapezoid shaped, and then your serratus anterior are sawtoothed. And then platys means flat. So your platysma in your neck is a flat muscle. There it is. Could also be named by the action of the muscle. Flexor and extensor, flexes and extends. Abductor and adductor, abduct and adduct. Supinator and pronator, supinate and pronate. And there's some examples there. You guys do have to know some of these, so make sure you check your list that I posted. Could also be named by the number of origins. Biceps, you have two origins. Triceps, you have three origins. Quadriceps, you have four origins. Could be named by the location, the temporalis and the tibialis anterior. The temporalis is by your temporal lobe. The tibialis anterior is on the front of your tibia. So there's the temporalis and the tibialis anterior. Could also be named by the origin and insertion, like the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The sternum clavicomastoid. The mastoid process, sorry. <laughs> okay, so muscles are divided into groups that move specific areas of the body. So make sure you go through these in your book and are familiar with them. As I said, look at the list that I posted and make sure that you know those, of course. So typically muscles are attached by tendons or an aponeuroses. So they're inserted or originate from using a tendon <clears throat> or an aponeuroses, which is just a flattened tendon sheet. Facial muscles typically originate on bones or fascia and are inserted into soft skin tissue, and that allows us to have the facial expressions that we can create. So here's some facial muscles in action. You can set this up to where you can go through the facial muscles and try to figure out the action and see if you get it right, because there are arrows that show you which are which. So make sure you practice with this, as it's a good practice. So here's the temporalis showing you the aponeuroses, which is the flattened tendon sheet. That aponeuroses happens to connect the frontalis muscle and the occipitalis muscle. There's the orbicularis oculi around your eyes and the orbicularis oris around your mouth. The zygomaticus major and the buccinator muscles, those are chewing, and the masseter, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, 
and the platysma. Muscles that act on the abdominal wall, we have the rectus abdominis, transverse abdominis, external and internal obliques. From superficial to deep, you have the external oblique, the internal oblique, and then the transverse abdominis. These are basically three layers of muscle that surround the abdomen and protect our abdominal organs, and they're arranged in different ways, different directions. The external obliques are oblique in one direction, internal are oblique in a different direction, and then transverse abdominis are perpendicular. So the actions, they compress the abdomen and flex the vertebral column, except for the transverse abdominis. The obliques also laterally flex the spine and rotate the vertebral column. So that's kind of important too. The rectus abdominis aids in defecation, urination, and childbirth. It basically goes along the entire anterior abdominal wall. It originates on the pubic crest and inserts on the xiphoid process and coastal cartilage of ribs five through seven. The xiphoid process, hopefully you remember, is the bottom of the sternum. You have the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. Usually three tendinous intersections. Hypertrophy is what gives you a six pack appearance. So if you build up those muscles, you have that six pack it's called. It's covered with aponeuroses and also forms a midline structure called the linea alba, which basically goes straight down the middle of your body. Your abdomen, I should say. So the linea alba extends from the xiphoid process down to the pubic symphysis. So as I said, down the whole midline of your abdomen. So here's the external obliques, the internal obliques, and the transverse abdominis. There's the rectus abdominis. There's that linea alba. An inguinal hernia is most common in males, and that's actually a protrusion, usually of the small intestine, through the abdominal wall. And it's usually because the abdominal wall became weak. It's felt like a lump underneath the skin and requires surgical repair as it is very painful. And if it gets worse, more intestine could come through the abdominal wall and you could have some real problems. Proper breathing during weightlifting generates intra-abdominal pressure, and it is very important to breathe properly when you are weightlifting. So to breathe, inhalation, breathing in, your thoracic cavity is going to increase in size. Breathing out, your thoracic cavity is going to decrease in size. These muscles are attached to the ribs and help change the size of the thoracic cavity. And you're going to learn about breathing specifically how it happens in respiratory in AMP2. But for now, the diaphragm powers breathing. That's what expands the thoracic cavity during inhalation. It separates the thoracic and abdominal cavities. And it's dome-shaped so that when it contracts, it actually goes down. There are openings for structures to pass through, which is, of course, very important. And a hiatal hernia is when the stomach protrudes through the esophageal hiatus. So if the stomach protrudes through one of those openings, you need to get that repaired as well. External and internal intercostals, again, breathing. So external intercostals, their contraction helps elevate the ribs and expand that thoracic cavity during inhalation. Internal intercostals, their contraction draws the ribs together to decrease the thoracic cavity during exhalation. The internal intercostal fibers run at right angles to each other. Insertions and origins of the intercostals are the opposite superior and inferior borders of the rib, so they kind of overlap. Additional muscles are also used if you have to have a forceful inhalation or exhalation. So if you take a deep breath or if you are blowing out candles, for example, the sternocleidomastoid, the obliques, and some abdominal muscles, muscles also help with that. So here's showing you again external, internal, intercostals, the diaphragm, the openings for certain things in the diaphragm. So muscles that move the pectoral girdle originate on the axial skeleton and insert on the clavicle or the scapula. The main action is to stabilize the scapula for the arm muscles. 
So we're having abduction and adduction. The serratus anterior muscle abducts the scapula and upwardly rotates it. It is flat and fan-shaped, and it originates on the ribs. It looks kind of like sawtooth, and then inserts on the scapula. The trapezius adducts the scapula and upwardly rotates. It's the large, flat, most superficial on the posterior neck and trunk, and it's right there. Oops, sorry. The rotator cuff muscles are very important. The subscapularis, supra and supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor join the scapula and the humerus, and their tendons form a circle around the shoulder joint called the rotator cuff. So this rotator cuff try, kind of helps stabilize the shoulder joint a little bit. Since we already know that the shoulder joint is most easily dislocated because the glenoid cavity is not very deep, it doesn't hold the humerus very well. We have these extra muscles and all of the tendons and ligaments to help kind of stabilize it. But if anybody has ever played baseball or anything, they may have torn their rotator cuff muscles. It's a very painful reparation. Surgically, it has to be repaired. And basically, they kind of go in, they scrape off the bone, and put pins in to reattach these muscles. And it can be a very long recovery and very painful from what I've been told. But those rotator cuff muscles are very important to stabilize the shoulder. Humerus, most of the muscles originate on the scapula and insert on the humerus. The pectoralis major adducts medially and rotates. It flexes the arm at the shoulder. The latissimus dorsi, which is on your back, your posterior, adducts and medially rotates and then extends the arm at the shoulder. The deltoid is a scapular muscle that forms the shoulder mass, and this abducts and medially rotates and then flex and extends the arm at the shoulder. It originates on the clavicle and scapula, the acromion process and spine specifically, and inserts on the deltoid tuberosity which remember was on the humerus. So there's the serratus anterior, trapezius, pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, deltoid. Muscles that move the radius and the ulna, so the forearm, these are located in the upper arm. The anterior arm muscles flex the forearm and the posterior arm muscles extend. So these flex, these extend. So the triceps bronchii extends the forearm. It inserts on the olecranon of the ulna. The brachioradialis flexes the forearm and supinates and pronates the forearm. And that's right there. And then the biceps brachii flexes the forearm and supinates the forearm. And it's right there. So the brachioradialis, that's one that kind of runs from the brachio down the radius. So... You have that brachioradialis, and we know that the brachial artery is the one that we measure blood pressure on, and it's in the same area. Maybe if that will help you remember. If not, don't use it. <laughs> okay, moving the wrist, hand, and fingers. They're in the forearm region. There's quite a few of them, flexion versus extension. The good thing is most of the ones that flex are called flexors. Most of the ones that extend are called extensors. The palmaris longus weakly flexes the wrist. So, you know, it's not called a flexor, but you get the idea. So there they are. Flexors and extensors. Golfer's elbow occurs if you strain those flexor muscles. And it's from the action of, of course, swinging the club. Muscles that move the thigh, all right, your femur. So these muscles are large and more powerful than the arm muscles, of course. You have to think your arms versus your legs, you need more power. The gluteus maximus extends and rotates the thigh laterally at the hip. The gluteus medius 
abducts and rotates the thigh medial at the hip. The tensor fasciae latte flexes and abducts the thigh at the hip. Oops, sorry. I also wanted to point out the semi-membranous, semi-tendinous, and biceps femoris. Those are your hamstrings. On top here, muscles that move the leg, the vastus lateralis, rector femoris, vastus medialis. Those are part of your quads. The gracilis is the inner leg, basically the inner thigh. And that flexes the leg at the knee, medial rotates the thigh and adducts at the hip. The sartorius muscle right there goes all the way across your thigh. That's the longest muscle in the body. And it's actually referred to, sorry, as the Taylor muscle, Taylor's muscle. It flexes the leg at the knee and flexes laterally and rotates the thigh. So when you cross your leg, it, it crosses across your leg. Okay, so like I said, the hamstrings, the semi-membranous, semi-tendinous, and the biceps femoris flex the leg at the knee and extend the thigh at the hip. The quads extend the leg at the knee, the rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and then there's another one, vastus intermedius, that you couldn't see on that last picture because it's actually underneath the rectus femoris. So there's the semi-membranous, semi-tendinous, and the biceps femoris. And the way I remember the difference between the semi-membranous and semi-tendinous is if you look at the picture, the semi-membranous kind of surrounds the semi-tendinous in a way, and it looks kind of like a membrane to me. But, you know, again, if it doesn't work, don't use it. And then the vastus lateralis, rectus femoris, vastus medialis, and again, the vastus intermedius is underneath the rectus femoris. So moving the foot and toes, we have the tibialis anterior, which is on the front of the tibia. It dorsiflexes and inverts the foot. The gastrocnemius is your calf muscle, basically. It plantar flexes the foot and flexes the knee. And then the soleus is underneath the gastrocnemius and that plantar flexes the foot. The fibularis longus or the perineus longus, plantar flexes and everts the foot. So you have the tibialis anterior and the fibularis longus that act as antagonists gastrocnemius, soleus, and fibularis longus are synergists, so they add to the movement. And then the gastrocnemius and soleus are inserted by the Achilles tendon. If you have shin splints, basically it's your tibia. You have soreness. Sometimes it's due to tendonitis associated with that tibialis anterior. Other times it's just, you know, just your injuring and running a lot. So it really depends, but shin splints are tibial soreness in a nutshell. Plantar fasciitis is an inflammation of the plantar apron neuroses, and it has an origin on the calcaneus. So this is the most common cause of heel pain in runners. Oftentimes, if you run a lot, your heel just gets really sore and really painful, and that's because of this inflammation. Here's a big picture of the muscles, so make sure you go through the ones that you're supposed to know from your list. Posterior, same thing. This is just an overview of selected muscles and movements for you. Again, make sure you're connected to the internet and in slideshow mode to view this. Most running injuries actually involve the knee. They're usually related to doing something wrong. You're not training properly. You're not running properly. They can be treated with price, protection, rest, ice, compression, and elevation, NSAIDs or corticosteroid injections, so ibuprofen, and rehabilitative exercises, of course. 
Compartment syndrome happens when the pressure constricts the structures within the blood compartment. And what happens is those blood vessels, because of the pressure, they become damaged. If it's untreated, your nerves can suffer damage, and then you're going to have a lot of deeper issues, and the muscles can develop scar tissue. If they develop scar tissue, they will lose that ability to contract. So if you do suffer from this, you want to get it treated quickly. And then, as I said, plantar fasciitis, the painful heel condition. So it's just a chronic irritation of that plantar aponeurosis by the calcaneus. Treatment, ice, heat, stretching, losing weight will often help because it takes pressure off. Prosthetics, steroid injections, and possibly surgery, depending how bad it is. So that is chapter 11. Make sure you know, again, the ways to name muscles. So follow your study guides. And then make sure you know those muscles, origins, and insertions for your lab practical from the study guide posted. And as always, any questions, just send me a message.